Um, so to start off with the panel, I wanted to just ask a very, very general question based off of, of what the meaning of this panel is, which is how, how do each of the panelists feel or know that uh, ferry equity, transit equity will improve their neighborhood or the city as a whole? Um, and specifically the question around neighborhood is, is for Cheryl, and I apologize, I did realize you're from the Bronx, which is extremely important, and the Bronx does is essentially needs uh, ferry service the most as it relates to transit transit equity. But I will start on my right unless somebody else wants to start before Hannah. Okay. Um, so in terms of, oh, okay, okay, that's my friend. Um, so transit equity is clearly a very important and complicated issue for the city, um, particularly at this point in time. In terms of what opportunities ferries play in bringing ferry equity to the city. I would, I would just like to say that I think ferries play in a very important role, particularly for waterfront neighborhoods that don't have access to traditional modes of transit, and especially as the waterfront is changing, uh, density is changing along the waterfront, and um, as Merrill mentioned, commuting patterns are changing, and there are different desires for different types of connections between neighborhoods. Um, but I would urge caution in that I don't believe that ferries are, can be our only solution. Um, they do have limited capacity. Um, you know, an entire day of strong ridership on the East River Ferry carries approximately as many riders as one hour on one train during peak hour commuting time on the subway. Um, so again, while I think ferries can fill an important gap, um, we shouldn't look at them as a silver bullet as our only transit solution. They need to be one piece of the broader puzzle and we need to look at all modes across the city. And I think we'll speak some more about integration between modes, um, but that the integration between ferries and other modes is also something very important that we need to keep in mind. Well, I agree with Hannah that it shouldn't be our, our sole um, solution to the transit issues. Um, over the last 10 or more years, We've seen uh, developments near the location where the ferry is being proposed, uh, new homes, new condos, and with not a lot of thought um, to how residents would commute. Um, currently, New York City Transit provides one bus that ends somewhere around midnight. So, you know, if you're not coming home right away, you, you know, you have to take a taxi. Um, and, and it actually has been, from what I understand from the MTA, um, the female bus drivers don't even like to go down there because it's, you know, so death, um, isolated. Um, we believe the ferry would be a value added to the community, both from a transit perspective um, and from a business perspective. It's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to build um, businesses, you know, restaurants, vendors, et cetera, along the waterfront where the uh, ferry is being proposed. I agree wholeheartedly with Hannah that the ferries are... Meryl, do you mind just getting a little Sorry. closer? Okay. To yep. mic, sorry, okay. Or maybe you and Pierre can share, so okay. that's... It. How's this? Is this okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, I first of all, I want to say that I agree wholeheartedly with Hannah that ferries cannot be the only answer to expanding the transportation system in New York City. However, given the ex incredible growth along, particularly along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront recently, I think it's a critical piece. So I think we agree wholeheartedly on that. Um, just to give you a few numbers, just while we're talking about this, the outer boroughs have accounted for 88% of the city's private sector job growth since 2000. 70% of that has happened in Brooklyn and Queens. And that's been driven by a large part by the waterfront and activity at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, the industry city coming online soon. That will be another hotbed of job growth. And so, and then in addition, 75% of the city's population has been in the outer boroughs since 2000. So we have a lot happening out there and people, more and more people are commuting between jobs in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens and are not, and the, not everyone is coming into Manhattan as it was when the transit system was first designed. So I think, again, to Hannah's point, I think we have to look at the entire transit system and look at these commuting patterns and figure out where the holes are. You're all familiar, Brooklyn and Queens are connected by just the G train. Um, I 
have lived on a G train for many years, and I know I, it's, it's it gets you where you need to go if you're going in between, but not necessarily on the weekends. And there's always service interruptions, so to have another option um, through the waterfront, it's would be amazing for the people who live there, the people who are commuting between Brooklyn and Queens, and then also these new areas of job growth that we're going to see coming online in the next few years. We've also, at the partnership, we've heard, so the Brooklyn Navy Yard was a tremendous success. I think I saw Andrew Kimball walk in so um, over the years, but over the last few years. But we've also heard at the partnership, we heard from many of our members saying that they were concerned about the lack of transit at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so we're not first in line to invest because they were concerned that they would not be able to get their workers to the Navy Yard easily. And so again, as these new areas like Industry City and other developments come on board, we need to be thinking about that because companies are going to be looking at the transit to make sure that they can get their workers there easily um, and as well as connecting to the surrounding neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I also uh, agree entirely with, with Hannah. And, uh, uh, but um, one thing that, that I'd like to maybe uh, mention is that when we're talking about uh, what ferries can do uh, in terms of serving uh, people who live on the waterfront, I think there's maybe a distinction between uh, areas that have seen tremendous growth that are quite near uh, the, the central business district in New York. And those places, I think, have, we, we can show that they have benefited in significant ways from ferry service. And they've also, ferries have generated high ridership there. Some other areas that, that need, would, would ideally have ferry ridership are gonna be a little bit of a harder equation to solve because the operating costs are gonna be high uh, and, and the ridership is not necessarily gonna be as high as some of these other places. So what, a strategy that I think is, is very fruitful personally and I think that is one that that EDC looked at uh, uh, and asked us to look at in the citywide ferry study is how can we uh, merge different uh, stops into routes where there could effectively be a way for uh, a route to be anchored by a high ridership route, which on its own probably generates perhaps even a profit. And how can that route, how can that stop be merged into a route with another location which will have higher operating costs and lower subsidies, I mean, lower ridership, but uh, can, has a demonstrated need for increased accessibility. So I think that's one of the way forward, which is how can you cobble together um, the, these, these different stops into something that might work uh, for, for, for uh, uh, increasing accept, uh, accessibility. Great, thank you. So. So just to, to summarize very quickly, we, we recognize that there's a limitation on the capacity of, of boats. So here we're on a boat and there's probably, I think this is a 800, 600 capacity boat. So you can only put so many people on these boats. Once you get to that capacity level, you really, it becomes an issue because then you have people waiting on your dock. We also have the, the recognition that there's been a lot of land use values that have changed in, in the recent era in New York City. And, and when I had heard Bill Braxton speaking recently, that was looking to that there was um, additional or less crime in the, in the in the in New York City, and housing values have increased greatly because New York City has become a a more desirable place to live for various reasons. And also, the New York City has been looking at upzoning and on the waterfront, so changing it from manufacturing zone and going into residential and commercial. And there hasn't been a lot of thought into what surrounds that those types of changes. And also, Merrill is now recognizing that people aren't just going from, and thank you for correcting us, that people aren't just going from, uh, say, Bronx to Manhattan, but people are actually going from Bronx to, to Brooklyn. And how do we look at the five boroughs and, and, and I caution New York Harbor in a, in a holistic way, so recognizing what people's travel patterns are. And then finally, Philip is, is saying, well, how, how, do, how do we make sure that ferries are working for us? How are we looking to cobble together everything that we have already and in, further integrate those, those services? And in, in that, as part of that, 
one of the things that I look at as a, as a ferry operator is what are the, the upland amenities? The New York waterfront can be extremely harsh, as we all felt today. That's very windy, but it's especially windy here on the waterfront. It's especially cold um, during the winter months. It, when we had were running the East River Ferry Service, New York Waterway, uh, New York Water Taxi, excuse me, piloted it before New York Waterway. Unfortunately, my staff would get mugged on a regular basis just walking from East 34th Street. And that's because there's a criminal element be due to the isolation of the waterfront. And so I wanted to ask the panelists what, what their thoughts were on, on those real nitty gritty infrastructure costs and, and looking to creating upland amenities as, as it relates to um, making the passengers feel comfortable. Thanks. Um, so we, for the East River Ferry, the pilot service has been running now um, for almost three years. In June, it will be um, the conclusion of the three-year pilot. Um, and that's, just for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it serves seven stops along the East River, um, one's two in Manhattan, one in Queens, and the, the remainder in Brooklyn. Um, so we do regular surveys of our riders, and the biggest, in general, um, <coughs> satisfaction with the service is extremely high. People who use the ferry really love it, but the biggest request for change is for better shelters, um, for better weather protection, particularly for commuters. Um, so, you know, for commuter services, we really, you know, for ferries in general, you see a seasonal impact in ridership. Ridership is higher on a beautiful day than on a cold, rainy, windy day. Um, but we do, um, we do see a lot of value in improvement in shelters. And we have actually started to do some additional research um, looking at services to New Jersey, which have very different levels of shelters on the Jersey side to see if the ridership changes um, really vary significantly depending on what type of shelters the services have. So um, that's something we're looking into. In terms of other upland amenities, our we work, we try to take the information that we have found from the services we're involved in and work closely with other agencies to share that information. So we work closely with city planning, with parks, um, and our most recent initiative was actually a zoning text amendment for Community District 1 in Brooklyn. Um, so now for any ferries entering into a residential zone in Community District 1 in Brooklyn, we have increased the capacity of boats that can serve those areas, but we have also created a requirement for trash receptacles for proper queuing areas so that you can maintain a distinction between people waiting for a ferry and those who want access to the waterfront walkways. Um, we have a requirement for bike racks. Um, and in term, although shelters are not a requirement. Um, they're certainly desirable, and we have a standard um, shelter design that we worked with city planning to develop um, that we're hoping to use going forward. I think that's a great question because um, I think that's a question that has come up on every meeting that we've had on this issue. Um, <clears throat> before, I think that before I think the community totally buys into having a ferry there, um, there are some questions that haven't been answered that um, I'm sure they would like to know before, um, you know, everybody gets in on this. Um, tra traffic is a, a, a major issue uh, for the residents over there. Parking will be a major issue. Um, there's a lot of homeowners over there. Um, so, you know, they're wondering uh, what the uh, impact on property values will be. Um, we haven't talked yet about the environmental studies that have been done. Um, also, will it be safe at night? Better lighting, increased police presence. So um, as these meetings continue, we'd like to see the local uh, precincts get involved in these discussions to see how they plan to combat um, crime um, in these areas. In addition, we want to make sure that our community is part of the planning. Um, to ensure that it does not have a negative uh, impact on the community. From the partnerships perspective, the one thing we'd love to see, and I know it's 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 
pie in the sky at this point would be integration with the MTA system entirely so that the metro cards can be used on the ferries. Because this is something that we hear about regularly from our members who use the ferries and also members who are looking to locate in areas where use of the ferries would be possible by their employees. Um, it just adds another layer of um, inefficiency for their employees and just uh, another barrier to getting more people on the ferries. Um, I think in in terms of, so I, I lived in Red Hook until just a few a few months ago, and I used the ferry all the time that, that IKEA and the water taxi, New York water taxi, have in line. Um, I always wish it started early in the morning, though, so I could actually use it to commute to work as opposed to just coming home, but um, but we'll take what we can get. So, but... And the, the again the connection on the other side you can it's a, you can easily walk to a bus, but in some cases that's not true. In some of the other stops, you can't easily get to a subway station or a, or a bus stop without walking more than a few minutes, and that's going to again put a barrier in place for a lot of people who are not going to use the ferry system. So the more that we can look at this system as a whole and really figure out what connections need to be made upland, I think will be critical to any expansion of use. Um, I don't have that much to add to what's been said already other than just to say from a, from the perspective of, of having a sustainable service, it's always good to try to iron out the, the, the seasonality peaks. And, and as Hannah says, I think you're, you're always going to lose leisure uh, trips in, in winter months. Uh, but I think that what you see is on, on services such as uh, the sea bus in Vancouver or, or the Staten Island Ferry here, is that that seasonality um, is, 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 is not nearly as pronounced, and that really has a lot to do with the fact that people use it on a more consistent basis for, for a journey to work. And, and even though you can adjust ferry schedules fairly uh, flexibly, I mean, it's still having, having not losing that journey to work component during the winter months quite as much is, is something that, that's got to work out. Uh, favorably for uh, the financial sustainability of the service. Wonderful. So we've heard some really excellent ideas about including um, police precincts in, in local areas, looking to really fortify the upland shelters, um, thinking about the lighting, and also thinking about how to ensure that there's good connection service from, from those ferry routes. Um, so this, this question is, in, in New York City, all but one ferry route is operated by a private ferry operators. There is very little equality among ferry routes and how operators benefit from operating, or from operating in capital subsidies. As, ex as an example, New York Waterway pays for its own buses for Manhattan Connection, both on the Hudson side and also on the East River side opposed to the Staten Island Ferry, which we've already mentioned, has a 100% subsidy and is very well served by Upland Connections. And, and Philippe, I would, love to, I would love to hear your thoughts first. As, a, as, an, economic, as an economist looking at the, at the New York City um, region and the economy and the economics of this, um, how do you envision New York City taking a more active role in creating additional transit equity in neighborhoods with these types of, of diversity and also distinctions between the routes and the, and the ferry operators? Uh, right. I mean, I think that's a, a, a very, very important question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned already the idea of trying to, in some way, uh, optimize routes so that you're, you're effectively trying to do some cross-subsidization of different stops. Um, I'm going to say that one area that personally to me I think looks, uh, looks promising, and it's one that, is, that plays a, a significant role in other forms of transit, um, such, you know, such as subways or, or commuter rail, and that is to think about, and this is not something that necessarily the city uh, is, would be the, the, the actor, but it's just generally how can one try to generate some uh, resources towards passenger ferry service. One of the things that you consistently see in transit is that transit creates value, creates value for people and then that value for users, whether they use it or not, in the sense that then that value is often cap, is, is usually capitalized is the economic term into real estate uh, property value. So in other forms of transit, um, and we've seen it here in New York, um, 
you know, with the extension of the seven line, certainly, uh, people have been looking for a long time at how can one try to capture that value that is created by what is often a publicly uh, subsidized uh, service. And that value is, uh, be becomes uh, uh, captured, is, is part of real estate value. So how can one try to get this value that's cap that's that's generated somehow uh, routed into uh, into uh, a resource to operate ferries, and that is, I think, a challenging um, area. But I think it's one that, to me, seems uh, like the one that holds right now the most promise in terms of uh, a way to increase the resources that are available for passenger ferries. Great. Does any, Meryl, Hannah, Cheryl, do you guys want to respond to this question or? Um, I would just, I would just add that I think that there's a unique opportunity with Mayor de Blasio's call for 200,000 units of affordable housing um, as part of his policy platform, because we we're talking about getting people from where they live to where they work. Uh, for the, I know we're, there's also a tourism element, but from, from the sustainability of the city's economy, that's what we're talking about here. So is there a way when we're looking at where those affordable housing units are going to go, we should also be looking at the transit options that are available to where uh, where those buildings are? Because otherwise those units will not raise, they will not gain the value that Pierre is talking about right. here without those transit connections. And then we'll end up with islands of housing that won't be well connected to their communities or more, most importantly, to the job centers. So I think it's a really important piece, and this is a unique opportunity at this time with this new administration to look at that. Yes, could I, could I just add Go to ahead. that? A absolutely. It's something that you're absolutely right, Meryl. I, I think that uh, I shouldn't say that it's an automatic uh, effect. And really, uh, you could very easily, and there have been many examples of this, have an ill-conceived transit service that generates little to no ridership, which means it's not really generating value or benefit to people. And you, in those cases, you shouldn't expect to see that there is a big uptick in the real estate value around the transit station. So exactly. I mean, what we looked at in citywide ferry study um, was uh, uh, areas where um, there had been uh, a tremendous amount of development and those areas in which there has been tremendous amount of development in Queens and Brooklyn generated lots of ridership. And when you look at the benefit for those people who live right along the water to take the ferry, if they were, let's say, in Midtown or Lower Manhattan, there's an obvious benefit just looking at the time it takes them to walk out of their building and get to work. And that's the crux of, of how you generate that value that then gets capitalized into real estate. Great. So I want to, and I think somebody actually wrote this question much more eloquently than I had in my notes to you all, but what factors will be considered when analyzing future viability for routes that are currently in the pilot period? And to me, that to that question is, where do we think current routes will be, and where do we think demographics and the constituents and, or passengers will be going from and moving to? And if the panel can just talk about location. Yeah. Um, so I've worked very closely with Pierre on this um, in our recent study, trying to identify where um, where residential development is happening, what new job centers are forming that are near the waterfront, um, and looking at commuting patterns across the city. And I know that outside of the realm of ferries, EDC is also looking very closely at commuting patterns around the city. Um, in terms of determining what routes are viable and what makes a viable route. Um, we have a lot of lessons learned and things that there are different lenses in terms of transit planning, um, but ferries are very expensive to operate. So um, on the ferries that we are most closely involved in, fuel costs account for over half of the operating costs to run a ferry system. Um, so minimizing fuel costs is really key in terms of reducing the subsidies needed, maximizing ridership, 
Um, so density is also a very important factor. Um, but that being said, and I think what you'll see in the ferry study is that you don't need to be the highest ridership location to be considered as a viable stop on a potential ferry service. Um, so as Pierre mentioned earlier, um, we see a lot of strength in tying together different neighborhoods as a network where you might have a very strong location um, that if you were to run a ferry to that location, you might be going by another neighborhood that's underserved and might have lower ridership, but there's minimal cost and time added to add in that second neighborhood. So we are really emphasizing the different neighborhoods across the city work together to try to form, um, to use the information that we've provided in the citywide ferry study um, and work together to try to build these networks where the different neighborhoods really support each other. and. Um, I see that as one of the most important factors. So I'm here to support Soundview. So you know, we 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 support um, EDC's uh, paper on the demographics, and we believe that we are a perfect place to um, have the um, ferry because um, we have a number of professionals who do work in Manhattan. Um, and we also think that people will be using it on the weekends. So, you know, for us, um, I think Soundview would be a great location. Also, um, going further, we would like to see it go to LaGuardia Airport. We're minutes away from LaGuardia Airport. It'd be a, a great mode of transportation for people um, who really don't want to spend 50, 60 bucks to go across the, the bridge, you know, in a taxi. And when they can get to the uh, LaGuardia Airport for whatever the amount is, four to six dollars. Um, they really haven't said yet, but that's what I think. I can I can throw out some stats for you because uh, clearly research is in my title. Um, but so Bronx, just to back up your point on the Bronx residents, um, nearly forty percent of employed Bronx residents commute to Manhattan each day. That's about two hundred thousand total workers. And then an additional 43,000 um, employed Bronx residents commute to Brooklyn or Queens. So that's a fascinating number. I mean, I was surprised when I found out that it was so high. For the, one, for the Bronx residents who are commuting to Brooklyn and Queens, there's a, their commute is on average over an hour, which you can imagine given the way that the transit system is currently thick, um, set up. So I, I definitely think that looking at the Bronx to Manhattan and hopefully connecting it with the Brooklyn and Queens routes as well would be a critical piece for helping these folks get to work faster and easier and opening up new job centers and, and new residential development. Um, I'm just going to say in general in terms of this, I, the, this question of, of you know, where is the ridership, what's a, a sustainable route. I mean, in general, one of the things that, that I'm really happy to see is that I would say since I've started doing ferry uh, studies here in New York, I, I, what I've seen is just a, a, a big increase in an understanding of the markets and how these markets operate um, and making ferries a little bit more closer to uh, other forms of transit, which have been studied uh, much more intensively than ferries. And so I think that at this point, People understand um, ferry markets, and I know in this region we understand them. Now, ferry markets here can be pretty diverse in the sense that why somebody would take a ferry has a lot to do with the access time. It has a lot to do with the modal alternatives that they already have. Um, and these things interplay and, and, come and, and are, I think, now easier to predict than they were. And the good thing about that is it then means when you're doing ferry planning, I think that there's less of a chance to make a mistake and, and maybe put a lot of resources into a, a, a route that uh, just won't work. And one of the things that I think we've learned, and I've learned from uh, past, past experience, is that if you, know, you really have to be aware of, of, a ferry might sound like a great idea for a community living on the water, but if there's an existing Metro North or whatever station that's right there, that's almost a sure sign that it's going to be a very hard sell for people to take a ferry. So there is a bunch of, of, of lessons learned. There's models that have been developed by Staten Island Ferry, by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and, and EDC has as well. And I think that one of the good things is that these models are out there for people to use. And I think that ferry planning now can be much more informed and much less imprecise uh, in the future. And I think that's going to be good in terms of optimizing 
the the bang you get for your buck when you when you try to expand accessibility through ferries. So we have had a couple questions from the audience regarding uh, Roosevelt Island and uh, Hallett's points or or Queens West. Does do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, so Roosevelt Island and Hallett's Point are included in the ferry study, and they were included together on one of our recommended routes. Um, so so Hallett's Point has a significant amount of planned development along the waterfront um, that is a significant walk away from the subway, um, and that along that area, that subway line is quite crowded and approaching capacity. So we looked very closely at Hallett's Point. We included uh, all residential development planned through 2018 in our study. So the upcoming developments there were considered. Um, and Roosevelt Island, we also considered the developments coming online with Cornell, uh, the new visitors that have been going to Roosevelt Island for the Four Freedoms Park. Um, and they combined, again, we were trying to combine the strongest sites um, with sites with lower ridership. And through a lot of what you see in the ferry study, you see about six ultimate routes. But there was a lot of mixing and matching that went on. Those aren't the only routes that we considered. We tried putting together many different neighborhoods in the city. But we did come up with a route that um, had a relatively low subsidy that included Astoria, Roosevelt Island, Long Island City, and then traveling down further into Manhattan. So we've talked a little bit about the why, where, and now we, I want to talk. We've been receiving a couple questions around subsidies, specifically why is it that other forms of transit are, are heavily subsidized? And it seems that this seem, is a new concept for the ferries um, in New York City and the New York Harbor. So I, I had asked specifically if the, the panel had any thoughts of where the subsidies could be coming from, and then also if there could be some lighter color given around why ferries are looked at slightly differently. <clears throat> well, I do know for our area, um, Congressman Serrano has um, dedicated some funds towards this initiative, as well as one of our assemblymen, uh, Crespo, who also who has um, allocated money um, for this fund. So they could be coming from some of our elected officials um, and um, other you know, agencies within the city. Um, in terms of resources for subsidy, I would say that we are all ears. And really, the biggest challenge that we face in expansion of ferry service is access to operating funding. Um, capital funding is also very important. And most of the ferry infrastructure that you see here in New York um, has been uh, supported by some level of government subsidy. So government subsidies are very, very involved in the infrastructure. Um, in terms of comparing subsidies to other transit services, ferries are very expensive to operate. And Kyle mentioned this at lunch, but um, subsidies, they vary across the different ferry systems. For East River Ferry, our ridership has been very high. Our trip distance is very short. We have people moving in both directions at all times. And we've actually gotten to a point where our subsidy per rider on the East River Ferry is equivalent to that on local buses. So it's at about 220 or 225 per rider. Um, however, on routes that have large fuel costs, long distances, and riders moving in one direction with an empty boat going back to pick to start over again, the subsidy is much higher. Um, so I know there's a lot of concern with the fact that Staten Island Ferry is free um, and the ferry system that we're running to the Rockaways right now, there's a fare associated with it. Um, but just to give you a sense of subsidy for Staten Island Ferry, the subsidy per rider is just under $5 per ride. Um, for the Rockaway service, because of the distance um, and because of a variety of factors, the subsidy per ride um, per person that gets on that boat right now that the city is putting up is almost $30 per ride. Um, so it really varies. Um, compare that to the subway, which is just over 60 cents per ride. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of um, variation. Um, I think, I, and this is not necessarily my point of view, but it's one that I've heard uh, people who are transit planners uh, espouse. And, 
why ferries are maybe thought of differently in, in uh, let's say, in a location like New York is that um, I think people will tend to say, look, especially if you're in within on the East River, for example, you're not necessarily taking anybody out of a car. And so you're losing sort of those, those sort of upfront transit benefits that people usually point to. Uh, you're taking somebody out of, out of a subway. And uh, that subway is already paid for, is already, uh, it, that subsidy has already been paid. And those, sub, those subways, you might disagree, but you know, are generally still able to accommodate the volumes that the, the ferry does. So I think that that's a bit the reasoning is that um, as opposed to if you were uh, taking lots of people out of cars, which is a little bit more the story on the, on the Cross Hudson, um, then uh, you know, the question is, you know, what, what are you getting for that, that, that additional subsidy that you're paying? But again, that's not necessarily my point of view, but the question was, why are they treated differently? And that's, I think, maybe part of the reason. <laughs> Great. So along this line of, of subsidies and also agencies, in, in New, the New York Harbor, you can, as a ferry, a private ferry operator, you could be receiving subsidies either through New York City DOT, New Jersey DOT, um, EDC, Port Authority, and various other agencies. And as, as we had heard all earlier, EDC is an advisor and also a conduit for starting, for starting these types of, of pilot programs. Uh, there is a very different model out in the San Francisco Bay, which includes um, the Water Emergency Transit Authority, and, and ferries all fall under this uh, transit authority. Um, and there seems to be some thought and some idea given around the fact that ferries are crucial in disaster evacuation or, or, or response to something like Superstorm Sandy. Um, there, were fer there were several ferry operators that responded to um, emergency evacuation as well as responding to when the, the subways were down and being able to provide redundancy for, for transit. Does, has the, does the panel have any ideas about, uh, about this idea of, of emergency evacuation or disaster relief for ferries? Um, so I don't have any direct recommendations per se, but I'm very f familiar with um, WIDA out in San Francisco. I've gone out there, I've toured their facilities. Um, they are, they're a great partner and a, a great um, system f for us to, to learn from um, here in New York. Um, we have taken the information that we've gotten from the groups in San Francisco and tried to share it with the New York City Office of Emergency Management. Um, so ferries have played a very important role in terms of evacuation here in New York. Um, and no, we don't have an authority that oversees that. We also don't have their excellent funding source that they have from the state in order to um, support that authority. Um, but we are doing our best to learn from them and share that information with everyone here who is involved in emergency evacuation. And I do want to point out that they do have the advantage of being a single state opposed to the New York Harbor, which has to cross multiple state agencies. And, and as we know, that can create additional complications. Great. Um, so I, I've been getting a couple of questions about the Staten Island Ferry, and I'm a little resistant to ask this question given the last time I had talked about the Staten Island Ferry in public, and just given that perhaps having a free ferry service is not a, a prudent way for the city to be going forward because it a, creates a, a standard or a precedent for ferry service to be free, and in addition it, it creates this if there's an opportunity that it could be somewhat paid for out of either a 350, I've also received a, a $5. Is there, do you see any opportunity, does the panel see any opportunity for charging for the Staten Island Ferry? And is that something that the, the that any of the panelists have, have any thoughts about? Yeah. <laughs> well, Jim D. Simone is here, so I don't know what I should. <laughs> I said um, the Staten Island Ferry. <laughs> well, it used to be, you used to pay for it. Yeah. I remember that from my kid's uh, song in the grade school. But uh, um, I, I think that the Staten Island Ferry plays a, a different role uh, than uh, the, the rest of the ferry system. I mean, it's really moving the most people. It's about 70,000 people a day, which is uh, more than double of, the, uh, of, of all of the privately operated ferry services. Um, 
and the most of the other the private ones are the polar extreme where they're they're operating entirely out of the the fare box but again i i think i don't know there's i'm sure his history plays into it and and politics but um i i think that it's seen correct me if i'm wrong jim but that it's a cheaper alternative than uh, to build a subway so uh maybe that's part of the thinking <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, 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 just, I would go just ahead. Add, um, one thing I've always wondered about, I have nothing to back this up, but I wonder if there would be a way to pay up to charge tourists and not residents. Um, there, uh, the Staten Island Ferry is seen as a free way to go and see the Statue of Liberty mm -hmm. and not take one of the more expensive cruises around the harbor. It's, it's written up in all of the guidebooks that this is the free way to get your tour and get your skyline pictures. So would there be a way to offset the cost a little bit that way? Even if it wasn't, even if it was five, ten dollars, I bet most of the tourists who are traveling there would pay that versus the more expensive um, circle line tours. Just a thought. And Meryl, I've said that myself oh, uh, okay. on various <laughs> occasions, and, and we and great respect to the DOT and Staten Island Ferry. It's I just I had a bunch of questions on that. So I'm gonna. Uh, there's been quite a few questions regarding, and this ties into it, MTA integration, and if there's any possibility for an MTA integration into the ferry service as as a whole, and this could be a possible answer towards or looking towards this 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 larger question we had just asked. So I was wondering if the if the panelists had any thoughts about MTA integration? I'll take that question. Um, so I, I've looked at it this, I've looked at this several times and I think what it comes down to is I have a, the, as a private ferry operator, I have a fare box and my fare box is very crucial to me obviously. And so looking at an MTA integration, it looks, we have to look to a, a solution where MTA is either where MTA is either reimbursing us for our tickets and then also being very thoughtful around how, how much does it cost if you have a, a five dollar fare and, and the MTA has a 285 275 uh, 250 thanks um, so if they're looking at a 250 how do you how do you get that across the board is to a similar fare box schedule and fare ticket schedule to the MTA and it's something that I'm always encouraged to have the conversation with MTA, but it just seems that the logistics uh, may get in the way in a, a short-term solution, but I think it could, it's definitely a long-term plan for the city as well as uh, private ferry operators. We, we, can, uh, we have a couple of, a couple of additional questions, um, which I think revolve around getting people to, uh, to, to scenic areas in, in the harbor. So there's a lot of things that are going on in the harbor. So we've talked a little bit and, and mentioned that tourists are right now taking the Staten Island Ferry to go from Manhattan to the upcoming observation wheel as well as the mall that will be coming down there. But if, the, if there's been any thought from the city side about what we can be doing to be creating additional connections along the waterfront from destination to destination. So specifically when I think about the East River Ferry Service and, and perhaps why some of the weekend ridership numbers were so high would have been Smorgasburg. Smorgasburg is a wonderful waterfront activity where they have lots of um, delicious foods and, and it's a fair-like atmosphere. It's a, it's a wonderful connection. And there's also Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, with Jane's Carousel, which is another water wonderful waterfront destination. So. I, the question to the panelists is, has there been any thought given to creating destinations along the waterfront to, to enhance the, the, the ferry system? Um, I, I have a comment on this. I actually, and people have come to us, actually the Bronx has come up and um, the area around Ferry Point Park and the new golf course up in that area. And the question has come up, could service in that area combine um, that the new outlets going in and um, recreational destination with the commuter service. So we certainly discuss that and keep that in mind in all of our planning efforts. Um, I would say that while recreational ridership really helps these services, both the private services um, and the East River Ferry, it brings our subsidy per rider down significantly. Um, one big challenge that we face in expanding recreational destinations is that um, there's a lot of competition for boats during peak times on summer weekends. Um, so we have actually had 
that as a big challenge for the East River Ferry when ridership is very, very high with everyone going to Smorgasburg. There's also a concert at Randall's Island. There's a golf tournament across the harbor and everybody wants to use the boats at the same time. So I would just say that, um, and you also can't expect operators to have these large assets sitting idle all of the time and just having them ready for your one recreational event. So um, we are restricted in terms of capacity again, but there's a lot of potential if you can um, gain access to the boats. Um, I, I'm gonna say something about, uh, just from my perspective as someone who's done a lot of uh, analysis of, of, of ridership on ferries, I think that the journey to work part of, of ferry ridership is, is fairly well understood. The leisure part it is not really well understood for a couple of reasons, one of which is that there just hasn't been the opportunity for it to be to be studied. And the way to study that is to, uh, you know, do a lot of uh, sort of surveys and, 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 and perhaps workshops, but to really try to get at how much is the, the leisure ridership for to Governor's Island, for example, what does that really mean in terms of the well-being of New Yorkers? Because that indirectly then feeds back into the value of living or visiting New York, which is uh, pot potentially tremendous. Um, so in terms of, so it's not really a question about what new uh, routes, but just generally speaking, I think that we all know that, that the ferry uh, service to uh, leisure destinations and for leisure uses generates a tremendous value, but we just don't know really what that value is because for many of these routes, no one's being asked to pay, so we don't have a guide to at least what the minimum is that, that this is meaning to people. So I'm not saying that because I think that then they should be charged. It's more that then when we make the decision, should we do this, should we have a ferry go to X, Y, or Z location, that then we understand what that, that benefit is just in terms of the wider uh, well-being of, of visitors and residents in New York. Great. So I want to thank all of our panelists today. I want to thank all of the excellent questions that, that came from the audience today. Um, I believe we have a, a great program for MWA. This was a really great conversation. We were able to get some, some issues out, including some touchy issues. Thank you, Mr. DeSimone, for letting us beat you up a little bit more. Um, and I just want to, again, if we could have a big applause for our, our panelists today.